to start now by uh, telling you a little bit more about Lewis' theory. Last time, uh, we went through aspects of the cube theory of Lewis and showed how that that could account for single bonds and double bonds, but not triple bonds, and that uh, when that was superseded by the electron pair theory, the idea being that these electron pairs would in fact be oriented at the vertices of a tetrahedron, and I showed you that tetrahedron as inscribed in a cube last time, that you could then account for triple bonds. And if you looked at the notes, you also saw that certain aspects of um, the, the dynamic behavior of certain bond types, rotation around single bonds, hindered ro restricted rotation around double bonds, and so forth, those were accounted for by this electron pair theory in which the, the four pairs of electrons were oriented at these vertices of a tetrahedron. So that was uh, qu another quite important uh, triumph of that part of Lewis's theory. And uh, the problem was, although that electron pair theory as initially put forward by Lewis was so successful at accounting for the properties of many different kinds of molecules and was a good description of their electronic structure, there was one class of molecules, a very important class of molecules, namely those known as aromatic, And the most important member of the class of aromatic compounds is, in fact, the benzene molecule. Benzene has the formula C6H6, and we can easily calculate the number of valence electrons in benzene if we just say 4 for a carbon times 6 plus 1 times 6 for the number of valence electrons from each of the six hydrogens, and that's 30 electrons. So in trying to understand how these 30 electrons in the valence shell of benzene hold this molecule together, it's known to be a planar molecule, how do those electrons not only hold it together, but how do they account for the structure of benzene? And how do they account for its amazing stability, okay? Um, and this picture that I've drawn here is a representation of benzene that I'll explain to you in a moment, but it comes from a person by the name of Ernest C. Crocker. Ernest C. Crocker was an MIT uh, Bachelor of Science degree holder who, who earned that degree in 1917. So he was an MIT undergraduate like you. And he published a paper. Uh, let me write down the reference for that paper. This is Journal of the American Chemical Society, 1922, volume 44, page 16, 18. Okay. That paper was the first paper in which the Lewis electron pa pair theory was applied to an understanding of the electronic structure of aromatic molecules, in particular benzene. And the amazing thing about that paper is, well, there are many amazing things, but one of the amazing things about that paper is that there's only one author on that paper, Ernest C. Crocker. And Ernest is a, a, a very, very bright individual. Um, Nonetheless, didn't go on in graduate school to earn a PhD in chemistry. Um, had many various chemistry-related interests. Was ex was uh, uh, he explained the chemistry of many different kinds of fragrances and and odors, 
I think he was referred to as the man with the million dollar nose. So this person had quite a variety of interests. He worked uh, in, the in what was then the Applied Chemistry Laboratory at MIT after his graduation with his Bachelor of Science degree. And one of the things he was thinking about was how to use modern electronic structure descriptions, such as Lewis theory, to explain molecules like benzene. And so if you go and read this paper, you're going to find a very lucid discussion uh, of how the Lewis electron pair theory uh, could represent benzene according to this formula uh, that I've drawn here. And in this formula, um, there is considered to be an electron pair between each carbon and each of the hydrogen nuclei. There's an electron pair uh, along each carbon-carbon axis, as shown here and here, and so on, all the way around the ring. And then, uh, finally, you have six more electrons to come up to the number of 30, which is the number of electrons in benzene. And so the question really is what to do with this remaining six electrons. And uh, I've shown them around the, around the, the outside of the, the ring here, which is where Ernest arranged them in his, in his work. Uh, and I just want to point out that he put forward the idea that these six electrons were circulating uh, around the plane of the ring and involved um, a net one-half bond between each each pair of adjacent carbon atoms in the benzene ring. So, in effect, when we draw, when we draw benzene this way with a circle in the middle, we know that that circle represents the circulating six electrons in the in what we're going to call the pi system. Uh, but Ernest C. Crocker was the the man who put the circle into the middle of benzene, and he was an MIT undergrad, and this is a sole author paper. Okay, so this is a, aromaticity has a, a, a vast history in chemistry, and it's a still very much uh, active and unfolding history uh, because of the, the problems to our understanding posed by uh, electrons that seem to be circulating around a whole molecule rather than localized between pairs of nuclei. So Ernest Crocker, uh, Bachelor of Science, 1917, MIT, uh, had a huge hand in that. So I thought you might find that interesting. And uh, having looked at benzene rings like that, I'll now draw them perhaps another, another way that's also useful, which comes from Kekulé. Because I want to continue our discussion of Lewis acid base theory. And I'm going to draw two molecules here that are going to be pretty similar. Okay, when, when I write a molecule, as I have done here on the left, um, I haven't explicitly indicated each of the hydrogens that are present on the periphery of this substituted benzene ring, but you should understand from a formula like this that this is the molecule boron C18H15. And over here, I'm drawing explicitly at each of these peripheral positions on the substituted benzene rings fluorine atoms in place of the hydrogens. So this is a different molecule with formula B uh, C18 F15. Okay, um, these are both Lewis acids. And based on our discussion last time, if you were to add ammonia to one of these molecules, where would the lone pair of electrons on the ammonia bind? The boron. So yes, the, 
you have here a trigonal planar boron center. And if, if you were to add an ammonia molecule, the lone pair of electrons would come in and stick to the boron because the boron is electron deficient, just like the aluminum we discussed last time. It has only six electrons around it, and it wants eight. But what if we were to add one ammonia molecule to a, a flask containing both of those Lewis acids that would then be competing for the ammonia molecule? What I'm asking you to do is something I will ask you to do out throughout this semester, and that is to analyze a molecule's properties based on its structure and its composition. She said that it would preferentially stick to the one with the fluorines because these very electronegative fluorines um, are drawing electron density away from the boron. This, this is one of our most electronegative elements. So you have a whole bunch of fluorines in that molecule. The whole thing is, we call it, it's perfluorinated. It's a perfluorinated triaryl boron reagent. These, in fact, are great Lewis acids, really powerful Lewis acids. And they're modern Lewis acids whose uh, implementation in chemical processes has come about really in the last 10, 15 years. And in fact, we were talking a little bit about Professor Schrock last time. In some of his research, he's used that very fluorinated Lewis acid as an activator in catalysis to get catalytic polymerization reactions to work. And that's a very popular approach these days in Lewis acid chemistry. Uh, Lewis acid, the design of new kinds of Lewis acids with interesting molecular architectures is something that's very much a current topic in, of interest in research in chemistry. Because you can make lots of chemical processes happen um, when you have something that can tug on electron pairs. And this one tugs a lot harder than that one because this one has very electronegative fluorines to pull electron density away from that boron and to adju adjust the distribution of the electron density in the molecule. And we'll be talking more about electron density in a distribution in a few minutes in connection with what I'm going to show you now. And that is that has to do with this molecule, which is the SO2 molecule. Anyone know where SO2 comes from in nature? Or in the environment, I should say? Volcanoes, that's absolutely, yeah. And um, uh, also coal burning power plants. Coal is a very dirty fuel and it contains a lot of sulfur. And when you burn that coal without controlling the way you burn it, you emit SO2 into the atmosphere. So that can be a big problem and we'll, we'll try to understand why. Uh, one of the things that SO2 can do when it gets into the atmosphere is it can react with dioxygen and that can give you SO3 okay and um, if SO2 and SO3 are present in the atmosphere and if there is also water present in the atmosphere, acid rain, yeah, that's exactly the type of process that uh, you'll be we'll be talking about here. Um, uh, SO2 and SO3 
are examples of what we call anhydrides. Um, anhydride is a word that means without water. And so you shouldn't be surprised that SO2 can react with water. And when it reacts with water, it takes up water. And the product of that reaction will look like this. Okay, so um, H2O plus SO2 going to H2SO3. The name of this molecule is is sulfurous acid. Okay, and alternatively, when SO3 reacts with water. electron pair that should not have been there. So both SO2 and SO3, as they react with water, are going from a situation in which they are electron deficient to a situation in which the sulfur attains an octet. Okay? Um, and you should verify that the number of electrons that I've drawn up here actually is consistent with the elements that I'm using, with the state of charge that I'm using. But when SO3 reacts with H2O to give H2SO4, we have now got sulfuric acid. Okay. And as I did over there, I have two acids that I want here now to compare in terms of their relative strength. So here I've got a Lewis acid, SO3, and a Lewis acid, SO2, engaging in a hydration reaction, which produces sulfurous acid and sulfuric acid. And the type of acids that these are on the bottom is they are Bronsted acids. distinguished from Lewis acids in that uh, the way that they behave as acids is through uh, ionization that produces a proton. Okay? Um, a Lewis, it's, it, they're also Lewis acids because the Lewis definition of acidity is far more general in saying that acids are simply entities that can accept a pair of electrons. Protons can accept a pair of electrons, so they're Lewis acids. But if you're talking about Bronsted acids, you're talking exclusively about protons that are produced by ionization of some kind of a Bronsted acid. Um, so which one of these is the stronger acid? Sulfuric acid. And why? Okay, well, yes, down here you got the other one, right? So. Exactly. So when this, when this ionizes, uh, you get SO4 minus. I'll draw it a slightly different way that's more quick. You get HSO4 minus. So there's your ionization, and the idea now is that this O minus that you have, the negative charge, uh, can actually be shared among a greater number of electronegative oxygens here, namely four, as compared to here, where we have only three electronegative oxygens. Okay, so um, it's a consideration of the very electronegative elements in your molecule that will help you understand the properties that these molecules will have in terms of acid-base chemistry. Now, um, huh? 
how many electrons do we have in the valence shell of SO3? 24. So, um, and that being the case, what molecule from last time does that remind you of? Maybe seeing a picture of it will help refresh your memory. ALCL3. Exactly. Okay, I'm going to show it to you anyway. And this is going to be faster than last time if I set this up right. Yeah, okay. So just, just to remind you, and if we could have the lights down just a little bit for a moment. So I want to refresh your memory of the electron density distribution here in ALCL3. This is, this is an electron density isosurface of ALCL3. And what you're noticing is that uh, the, the electron density drops to a low value in between the central aluminum and the, and the radially disposed chlorides, that, that's three chlorides that surround that central aluminum ion. And the coloring in this is such that the blue regions represent regions in space where there's a high probability of finding paired electrons. Okay, so basically you have three Cl minuses that are packed tightly around an Al3+. This is a very ionic compound. Okay, see the, see the empty region in space between aluminum and chloride and the polarization of that otherwise spherical cloud of electrons around the chloride in the direction of that positively charged aluminum. So there's your electron density distribution for that. And now I want you to keep that in mind and we'll compare the isoelectronic SO3 molecule to it. Okay, SO3, here's another case where we have 3 times 8, 24 valence electrons in the system. Um, but the character of this molecule in terms of electron density distribution is very different. Okay, so uh, while on the blackboard, I'm not able to really tell you very much about the difference between SO3 and ALCL3, um, here I think you can see uh, that indeed they are quite different. This is an electron density isosurface at the same contour level as what we were looking at for ALCL3. Now, what you sh to explain this and to understand just what's going on here, you need to remember that the electronegativity difference between the central sulfur and the, the peripheral oxygens is not very great compared to the electronegativity difference between aluminum, which is a very electropositive and metallic element, and chlorine, which is a very electronegative halogen. And so what that results in, as shown here, is uh, a much more equal sharing of the electrons between that central sulfur and these peripheral oxygens. So even though these things are both Lewis acids and they both have 24 valence electrons, the, the electron density distribution in three-dimensional space for these molecules and the covalent versus ionic character of these molecules is really quite different. So um, our, our, our section that's going to be devoted to bonding, it hasn't really kicked into gear yet, but the nice thing is that Lewis theory applies both to acid-base chemistry and to bonding. So we're able to talk a little bit about that. In a few moments, I'll tell you a little more about a, an issue that's very important in chemistry as regards bonding. And it has to do with what happens when acids like sulfuric acid ionize in water. Okay, When, when Bronsted acids ionize in water, we get this ion produced. 
H3O plus, which is the hydronium ion. Okay, so that, that is to say that if you ionize in water some Bronsted acid, the protons that are produced through that ionization are not floating around freely, naturally, because they're positively charged and they're attracted to negatively charged electrons. So they look around in solution and they, they find the next source of an electron that they can. And you know that if we draw out a molecule like water according to the Lewis dot structure, it has two extra pairs of electrons in addition to those two pairs of electrons it's using in making bonds to its, the, the two hydrogens that are on the oxygen of the water molecule. So H plus isn't just isolated around by itself in solution, but it, it perches on an oxygen lone pair. Okay? So H3O plus is what you get when Bronsted acids ionize in water. And furthermore, um, when, you, when you put these things in solution, you find that you organize the water molecules that are close to the hydronium ion. So let's draw here a neighboring water molecule. And another one. And I think you can imagine that throughout a solution, we might have many of the kinds of interactions that I've drawn here as uh, dotted peach colored lines. Those lines represent what we call hydrogen bonds. And hydrogen bonds are enormously important in chemistry. Um, later, when we talk about the structure of proteins and DNA in particular, you may be aware that the du DNA double hel helix is held together by a network of hydrogen bonds between complementary base pairs. So hydrogen bonds aren't only restricted to the hydronium ion in aqueous solution. There are many other types of molecules that can form what we call hydrogen bonds. Um, another really interesting thing is that in water, the hydronium ion can move around really rapidly, much more rapid than molecules normally diffuse through aqueous solution. And the reason for that is if you look at the arrangement of electrons and nuclei here, um, all I have to do is, without even moving the nuclei much at all, uh, reorganize the hydrogen bonding network. as such. And now you can see that through just a slight set of motions, our hydronium ion has moved from the left hand side of this hydrogen bonded network where you can see it's indicated with the positive charge and the three solid lines drawn to the oxygen over to the right hand side but it did that not by coming off and, and moving over, but rather through just redistribution of the electron density so that the positively charged part ends up down on the other side. And so this way of propagating hydronium ion in aqueous solution is one of the really special aspects of Bronsted acid chemistry that takes place in water. And I think I'll also show you uh, what a hydrogen bond looks like from the standpoint of electron density. First, I'm just going to show you the position of the nuclei in a very simple hydrogen bonded system. Here what you can see, um, the, the oxygens are drawn in red as, as spheres, the hydrogens are drawn in white as spheres. You can see that the geometry around the oxygen atoms is slightly pyramidal, and that's due, of course, to the presence of that extra lone pair here up above one oxygen and here up above the other oxygen. 
And uh, what we have now is a hydrogen serving in a bridging fashion. And the number of electrons in this system uh, is, uh, is exactly 2 times 8, okay? Because we have two water molecules, and we have an H+. Plus. So this is a positively charged ion in which a hydronium ion, and you can pick either side, actually, is interacting with one of the lone pairs of the other water molecule. And you can imagine lots of different types of water clusters like this that are singly positively charged. And people have done a lot of work to study such clusters in solution. The, um, the si what you should remember, though, is that the size of the spheres that I've drawn there to represent those oxygens and hydrogens is somewhat arbitrary. But what's not, what it's not arbitrary is the way that the electron density represents a molecule like this. So we'll show that to you next. could have the lights down just a little bit, please, since this one's a little harder to see. Uh, what, what you should see here is that we have the same structure now um, surrounding that representation of the mole water molecule hydrogen bonded to the hydronium ion uh, that I drew a moment ago. We now have this sort of mesh, which is exactly what we've been looking at with these other molecules, namely an electron density isosurface. Okay? And what you can see is that the electron density is falling to a pretty small value in the middle here where we have the proton that is the connecting glue binding together these two water molecules in this 16 valence electron system. Okay? And after one more representation of that, we will be on to our next topic. This one is a solid display of the electron density isosurface associated with this hydrogen bonded cluster. And it is once again color mapped with this function that tells us about the probability of, of finding electrons paired up together in space. Okay, so there's H3O plus hydrogen bonded to H2O. The, the blue color represents those regions in space where you're most likely to find pairs of electrons. And you can see that um, the two OH bonds over here are nicely colored blue. The lone pair of electrons up here is nicely colored blue. And then uh, we have a situation where the, the blue is just a flat bridging H plus and the two lone pairs that are pointed at it that produces, our, in fact, our hydrogen bond. So there's there's a picture of hydrogen bonding in terms of electron density, and um, it's, it's a, a type of bonding that complements the straight covalent and ionic bonding that I was talking about in terms of SO3 and AlCl3. So we've added this third type of bonding, uh, hydrogen bonding, to our list of bonding interests. And now, We'll talk more about what we can do when we consider Bronsted acids ionizing. Here's a generic representation of the formula of a Bronsted acid HA. A might be, for example, uh, the HSO4 minus ion that we show, showed over there. When we put a Bronsted acid in aqueous solution, as I said before, we can get ionization into H plus and A minus. But we know that it's not just H plus, it's actually H3O plus, and H3O plus is further hydrogen bonded in networks in the water system. But for simplicity, I'll just write it as H plus right here. Recently, in your 
a crash review of thermodynamics, you were talking about equilibria and equilibrium constants, and we're going to make use of some of that right here because we're going to talk about the acidity constant, Ka. And that is going to be defined as equal to the hydrogen or hydronium ion concentration times the concentration of the conjugate base A minus. When a Bronsted acid ionizes, it produces what we call the conjugate base of the acid. Here's the conjugate base. Okay, divided by the concentration of the acid, and this is at equilibrium. And let me just emphasize something so that you don't forget it. This is an important piece of nomenclature. These square bra brackets here refer to concentration, usually in molarity. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. And concentration is something that can be measured. Uh, you may be familiar, for example, with the pH meter invented by Arnold O. Beckman and its utility in, in measuring the concentration of hydrogen ions in solution. Okay, well, we can make use of information like that to um, talk about the properties of our Bronsted acids. How can we do that? Well, let's say we're going to take a particular acid such as this one, which is acetic acid. You know the smell of acetic acid if you've ever been in an establishment where they were making barbecued chicken wings. Okay, and that's the smell of acetic acid. Beautiful, uh, beautiful smell. Um, anyway, what do you do here? You 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 try to you're trying to figure out what's going on. If you you have some concentration of the acid HA, which is in this, we're going to talk about acetic acid, and in solution there may also be hy hyd hydrogen ion or hydronium ion, and then. There may also be A minus, which in the case of acetic acid would be acetate. So, where we have two electronegative oxygens among which the negative charge can be shared in the acetate ion, which is the conjugate base of acetic acid. Okay, so we make a table. We have an, we need to have some initial concentration. So that is to say, uh, let's consider, for example, 10th molar acetic acid. So we're, we're just choosing 10th molar as a concentration for our acetic acid solution. What that means is um, you, make, you, you have a pure acetic acid, and then you dissolve it in water and bring it up to a total volume such that the concentration uh, was 0.1 molar, assuming that none of it had been ionized yet. Okay, and so that means we have an initial concentration of of acetic acid of 0.1 molar, and initially before the ionization we've got zero H plus or hydronium and zero A minus, and then uh, then the concentration changes, and it changes because the HA ionizes to some particular extent depending on the Ka value for the acetic acid. And what's going to happen is that some of the HA ionizes and the amount of the HA that's undergoing ionization is X, so we, we're going to lose X, and then that for every HA that ionizes, we get um, that same amount of H plus produced and that same amount of A minus and so then, after the system reaches equilibrium, we will finally have 0.1 minus x 
is our concentration of H A, and X and X will be our concentration, our concentrations respectively of H plus and A minus. And so um, let me put this board all the way up. Therefore, we can write the following that Ka is equal to x squared over 0.1 minus x by substituting into the, into the expression for the acidity constant. Ka is our acidity constant. And um, we, can, we, can, we, we can go to a table and look up the acidity constant for acetic acid because it's a known quantity. And it turns out that that is 1.8 uh, times 10 to the minus fifth. OK, and now, now that we have this equation um, for the acidity constant, and we know what the acidity constant is, we can solve this for x. Of course, this is a cubic equation. We're going to get two roots. You'll see that you get a positive root and a negative root. The negative root is meaningless because concentration can't be negative. So you pick the positive root. And when you've done that, you can then go ahead and answer questions like, um, what is the pH of the solution? And, and what, is, what is the percent ionization? OK? And uh, we can talk about that. And so next time, at the beginning of class, we, we will do that calculation. We'll find what the pH of a 10th molar solution of acetic acid would be. Uh, we'll also go on and talk about uh, pH and the pKa scale, and also a general equation for discussing titrations and buffers.